You know, this doesn't happen every year. But we're actually in Passover right now. I mean, the Jewish Passover. The, the Jewish Passover uh, this year in 2020 ends on the 16th. And I know we talked about Passover this last Sunday when we talked about the triumphal entry. We talked about how Jesus makes his way into Jerusalem. The people pick up palm branches and they shout, Hosanna. And, and during this time, we know that on Wednesday of that same week, Jesus sits down with his disciples and they break bread and they eat lamb and they pass the cup and they share in this holiday meal. It's very similar to our Thanksgiving because uh, they're giving thanks, right? They're giving thanks and they're eating this meal in remembrance of their shared cultural history. So I think there's this possibility that we get the wrong picture in our heads when we think about Passover. You know, we, we, we think of it as being happy. We think of it as being a celebration. And I, I, I do think, no, for the Jews at that time when Jesus comes through, they are happy and they are celebrating and they are thankful. But that's not how Passover started. And it's so interesting. No, interesting is the, is the wrong word. It's amazing how we, as a nation, are in Passover right now. So let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a famine in all the land. And there was a man named Jacob who took his family to Egypt to find food. Now, one of their own, another man named Joseph, found favor with the Egyptians, and he was able to provide for his people. And the nation of Israel grew and grew. And once Joseph died, Egypt grew fearful of the Hebrew people and enslaved them. And then along comes a man who could free them, a man who could be their savior. And he was a guy named Moses. And over the course of the negotiations that Moses had with Egypt, God unleashed nine plagues, but nothing worked. The Pharaoh was so stubborn and he was unwilling to let the Hebrew people go. So God sent his last plague, one that was different from all the rest. God sent death. Now this death was unlike any of the other plagues that had come before. First, because it didn't discriminate. Death didn't necessarily go after the elderly. Death didn't necessarily go after those who were sick. Second, there was very little warning. The people knew it was coming, but they had only hours to prepare. But what was also interesting was there was actually a way to escape it. There was a way for death to pass over you and those in your house. God tells Moses in Exodus chapter 12, for I'll pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments, I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the intel and the two doorposts and the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. Does that give you chills. It does me. I mean, how often do we read Bible stories and they're just stories? And we, we, we read about heroes and heroines and romance and betrayal, and we read these stories of slavery and mighty miracles, and we, all the time, we're the outsider. You know, we read these stories with a book that's propped open in our lap, 
And then when we finish, we just close the book and we get up and we go on with our life. And sometimes we think to ourselves, that's not my life. That's not the life that I'm living right now. But we are literally in Passover right now. Not the Jesus riding into town Passover, no palm branches, no cheering. No, not that Passover. The first Passover. The everyone scared and hiding in their house Passover. The one where everybody is just waiting for death to leave. The one where we're all waiting for freedom. There was one more piece of instruction for the Hebrew people, a cure, if you will, that could save everybody in the house. They had to wash blood across the doorposts of their house. And not just any blood. It had to be the blood of a perfect lamb. The family was instructed to take a perfect lamb, to kill it, and it was said to do it between the two evenings. So kind of like at dusk, at nightfall, somewhere maybe around 6 p.m. Exodus 12, verse 7 says, Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. So the blood is painted on the sides and top of their door frame. And they were to eat the lamb that night at dinner. And everyone's supposed to clean their plate, no leftovers. And God tells them to eat this meal with two other things, unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And both of those side dishes were symbols of sin and bitterness and sadness. The Bible continues, In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. God says, be ready to go. A little later in the New Testament, Jesus will tell his disciples, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. But also notice that God says, when I see the blood, he doesn't say, when I see you. He doesn't say, when I see your house or when I see the people in your house. He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. God makes a point to say, it's the blood of the perfect lamb that is seen. The blood is to be painted on the outside. And when I see the blood of the perfect lamb, I will remove death from you. I will spare you. I will save you. You will be free. Jesus celebrates the Passover meal again with his disciples. And I wonder how many of them, as they are eating and drinking and laughing and celebrating at this holiday meal, remember the first day when this all began, when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming up over the hill and John stretches out his finger and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So at this time in our worship service, it seems only fitting that we would share a moment of communion together as a church. And so I hope you have some elements ready. Uh, we've been telling you uh, this past week just to have some bread and something to drink, something that can represent the body and the blood of Christ. And if you don't have those things, you can hit pause right now on the screen and just run and grab those things and, and bring them back. 
And Joanna will lead us uh, through the table of the Lord. Hi, church. It is good to be with you. I wish that we were together, that we were here in the same room, but celebrating communion together is something that has deep connectedness already built into it. It isn't something where we have to sit in the same room with someone to be united with them, because really when we take communion on any Sunday morning, um, we are also sharing communion with other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world, who are sharing in this table and in this remembrance, and also all of the people who have gone before us. Some of my earliest church memories are taking communion, sitting by my grandparents, or sitting with other faithful Christians that walked with me. And I know that there were so many more before that. And so even though we might not be all together, we are united. And that is one of the things that Christ prayed for his church. He wanted us to be united, and this is a way of doing that. And so I hope that you are prepared and you are ready, that you have some elements, you have some bread and cracker, or you have um, something to be able to represent Christ's body, and then you have um, the juice, that you have something to represent his blood, so you have either some juice or wine, and that you are prepared to be able to have those elements together. So would you pray with me? Father, we ask that you would bless this time, that even though we are not present and together in one room, that you would unite us and that our hearts would be joined together in you and that we would have one purpose and one goal, and that would be to give you glory and honor and praise, and that we are just able to show you with our actions that we love you and thank you so much for the sacrifice of your son on the cross. In your name we pray, amen. So that holy week of Jesus's, his, his last week as he was headed to the cross, he celebrated the Passover that David spoke about. He celebrated that with his disciples and they gathered together in an upper room and he had his disciples with him. And Matthew records that they were together now after he was eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the give forgiveness of sin. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so... While they were together, Jesus gives new meaning to the Passover celebration. They had celebrated Passover their whole lives as young Jewish men, and that they were able to know that, and they knew that story of the Israelites. But what stands out when you read that is that Jesus is saying, my body and my blood. And I'm sure maybe the disciples had a little bit of pause in that moment and that they were wanting to have that revelation to be able to understand more fully what was about to happen and that in the weeks and years and months that transpired after that that they would understand and be able to remember back and all of a sudden that Passover meal would just take on a whole new meaning and it would make so much sense after he has Passover with his disciples, he teaches them and he gives them this one great big long teaching and it is recorded in the book of John starting with um, chapter 14 and then at the beginning of 15, he says some words that have really resonated with me during the time that we're experiencing. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then later in chapter 15 at verse 12, he continues and Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And 
I think right now, while we're all under these stay-at-home orders and to be practicing social distancing, we feel like we are not really being productive and fruitful. We feel like we are not showing love. We feel like we are just disconnected and not really connected. But this verse came to mind and it made me pause because Jesus is saying that the ultimate, the greatest love that anyone could do is that they would lay down their life, which we know in this story that he's days, hours away from doing that for us, that Jesus is about to head to the cross and ultimately give his life for us. But also we have this opportunity and while we are under stay at home orders, we have the opportunity to be able to lay down our lives, to lay down our schedules, to lay down our agendas and the things that we want, those freedoms, the ability to just plan our day and go about things and life is normal. But by not doing that, we have the ability to lay down our lives for our friends, for our family members, for those front care health care workers, and for the people with compromised immune systems and really for our community and for our strangers, for people that we will never meet, but we have no idea how this sacrifice is really laying down our lives for others. And so I was just encouraged by that. And then also um, it warmed my heart to know that that was also part of communion, that that was something that Jesus taught his disciples in that intimate group. And so while these pews are empty. I know that we are together. And so would you take the bread and have your wine or your juice? And would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you so much that your body was broken and that your blood was poured out. That by you being the perfect lamb, Jesus, that you are able to provide forgiveness for many. Lord, you provide forgiveness for all and that it is really just something that we have to accept and that we have to daily understand and realize that it is because of the grace of God and that you are giving that to us, that we are able to have eternal life, that we are able to live an abundant and full life. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that sacrifice. We ask that you would take this time that you would knit our hearts together. And we thank you so much for your sacrifice. In your name we pray, amen. The body of Christ given for you, take and eat. The blood of Christ given for you, take and drink. Thank you. I can't wait to be with you again. Have you ever wondered what God is like? Have you ever wondered what Jesus is like? The cross tells us. The cross gives us those answers. Jesus would be the perfect lamb. It would be his sacrifice that would take away all the sins of the world. That means that Jesus had to experience all of it. He had to experience the betrayal of his friends. He had to experience the rejection of God. He had to feel what it felt like to die. And of course, God could have stopped it all. God could have done it a different way. It's interesting, in uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical, Jesus Christ Superstar, Pilate sings a, a, a stanza that's very similar to that. Pilate sings, so you're the Christ. You're the great Jesus Christ. Prove to me that you're divine. Change my water into wine. That's all you need do and I'll know it's true. Come on, King of the Jews. But the Bible says in the prophet Isaiah, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers are silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus had all the power, but in this moment it was only the power to do nothing, because on Good Friday, Jesus dies. You know, typically at Good Friday, we spend a lot of time talking about the cross. And we spend a lot of time talking about the death of Jesus. But this isn't a typical Good Friday because this is not a typical year. And I know it's going to feel weird. You know, Easter is in a couple of days. We're all going to wake up and it's going to be Easter. And in our heads, we're going to be thinking, I don't spend Easter at home. Right? I don't spend Easter watching TV or sitting and staring at my computer. I go to church. You know, six out of ten Americans go to church on Easter. This Easter, the number of people in a church is going to be very, very small. But that first Easter, the very first Easter where Jesus raises from the grave, the first Easter was also not a celebration. Nobody was wearing pastel. Nobody was decorating with lilies. Nobody hid eggs. Nobody was planning on going to grandma's house later that day. The first Easter, where were the disciples? They were all hiding in their homes. John 20 says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Where are the disciples? The Bible says they're behind locked doors. Why? Because they're afraid of the people that killed Jesus. They were afraid that the same thing would happen to them. The first Passover in Egypt the people are indoors, at home, because they're afraid of the death that's outside their walls. Listen, Passover and Easter began with people hiding out in their homes. because they were afraid to die. I tell you, what's the good news? Exodus 12 40 says the time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The good news is that after that day, after the angel of death passed over those homes, the people were free. There was light. They could go outside. Moses records in the Bible that it happened 430 years later. In other words, from the beginning of captivity, from the day they became slaves to the day that they were released, 
was 430 years. And as the Hebrews are walking to the promised land, they came to the mountain of God. And it was there that God gave them a brand new covenant. God gave them the law, the new promise. And God told them before all of this, you belong to Egypt. Now you belong to me. I will be your God and you will be my people. And of course, then they began to uh, develop a, a written law. They would build a tabernacle. They would conduct worship services. They began to celebrate all these key historical events like Passover. The, the religion of the Israelites begins to take shape. But do you know what's interesting about this and why I mention this? It's something that takes place later. In fact, I want you to do something for me. Get out your phone or bring up another tab on your web browser and I want you to search Google for something. Search in Google how many years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? Just Google that. Somebody in your family, Google how many years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. What does it say? It says 400 years, right? 400 years. So not quite 430 years, but 400 years. That's, that's, that's pretty cool, right? If it had been 430 years, you'd have been like, wow, that's amazing. Well, just hang on, hang on. That's 400 years from Malachi to the manger. But Jesus grows up. In Luke chapter 3, it says Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. So from the Old Testament until Jesus begins his ministry is also 430 years. The author of Hebrews says, in speaking of a new covenant, Jesus makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. God promises Abraham a relationship. And 430 years later, it comes true. God promises the Hebrew people that they would be set free. And 430 years later, it comes true. God promises one day I will fix the problem of sin. and I will send a perfect lamb. And you won't need to ever celebrate Passover again. And 430 years later, it comes true. I know you're at home. I know you're bored. I know we're all going a little stir crazy. But the good news is Easter is coming. Our God sets people free. The good news is our God keeps his word. And it always happens in his perfect timing. In fact, all of human history turns on this most significant event. All of the sacrifices of the Old Testament point to the cross. It goes all the way to Adam and Eve. What happens when they sin? God kills an animal and gives them clothes. And those garments cover their shame. Then we see the story of Isaac and Abraham. And Abraham takes his son up the mountain to offer a sacrifice. And Isaac looks around and says, Dad, you didn't bring an animal. And Abraham says in his wisdom, God will provide the lamb. Every animal offered, every animal sacrificed in the temple was a foreshadowing of God's final offering, his own son, the perfect lamb. And even though for the disciples now, 
in this moment as they hide out after having just watched Jesus die on the cross and all the events that are playing out, they don't think that any of this is good. You know, we call it Good Friday. But this weekend, I'm sure it didn't feel good for them as they are hiding out in their homes. But what they can't see and what they can't even possibly understand is that Jesus is already on his way. Jesus overcame the power of death and he did that for us by raising from the dead and now we that believe in him get to be adopted into his kingdom forever. The perfect lamb became sin for us. Paul is going to summarize exactly what we've been talking about this evening. In Romans chapter 5, he says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, Shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. A Good Friday service is not typically a service where there's a lot of rejoicing. In fact, we never end a Good Friday service on a high note. And sitting at home right now, you're probably not in a rejoicing mood. I get it. But if we're truly honest about the cross and what it means in our life, and if we reflect on God's perfect timing and that he keeps his word, I think there is a reason to celebrate. Our sins are forgiven because of the cross. We are taken in as God's children because of the cross. We get to inherit the kingdom of God because of the cross. So may you this evening find peace among your worries. May you feel the protection of the cross. May you be encouraged when you put your finger in the holes of his hands. May you feel his love as you share a meal together in laughter. And may you have a blessed weekend and a wonderful Easter. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we might not be in a rejoicing mood. We might feel trapped and afraid, worried. We might feel hemmed in. We might even feel a little stir crazy and bored, maybe even at our wits end. We don't feel like rejoicing. And even though Easter is coming on Sunday, we don't even know how to feel about it. It's not going to be the same. Life isn't the same right now. Lord, your cross reminds us that your son suffers with us, that he experiences life with us, that he knows how we feel and he shoulders our burden. No matter what we go through in this life, we know that your son experienced more than we ever will. And he did that for us. He did that to shoulder our grief and to remove our sin and to reconcile us with our Heavenly Father. So no matter what happens, we have every reason to rejoice 
We have every reason to still pick up a palm branch and shout Hosanna because our King is coming. Our King beat death. Our King beat darkness. Our King beat sin and famine and poverty and disease. And he did it all with love. Lord, we love you. And we love each other. These friends, these members of church that we haven't seen in forever. Lord, we just pray that you are with them right now and that you are comforting them right now. That if your hand is on their left shoulder, then mine is on their right. Encouraging them that we will get through this, that we will be together again, and that going forward every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every Sunday is rejoicing. Every Sunday is resurrection. Every Sunday is new life. Every Sunday is new birth. But today, lead me to the cross where your love pours down. Lead me to the place where you saved me. Prepare my heart for Easter. Prepare my heart for joy and celebration. We thank you for all that you give us for every blessing. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us this evening. Thank you for hanging out with us and continuing to watch. You know, you can always share this video uh, on your social media walls so that your friends and family can see it as well. Hopefully it can be an encouragement to them. Come back on Easter Sunday. We will have Easter services at 10 a.m., both on YouTube and over on Facebook Live. Uh, Mike Morgan and the family will be back to lead us in worship, and it's going to be a great morning. I love you guys. I'll see you soon. Bye.